Good evening, I'm Neil Kirksal. Adrian and Andrew are away this week. Tonight, Ontario brings in a new lockdown plan. To save lives and prevent our hospitals from being overwhelmed. We'll look at the mix of acceptance, anger and confusion. This particular virus may not be more virulent. What you need to know about the latest COVID variant. Also coming up for you tonight. We almost never find mummified animals like this with skin and flesh. A baby wolf tells a story tens of thousands of years old. And on this winter solstice, a gift from Jupiter and Saturn. I've had a few neighbors ask me about it. We all wish we could have seen them. You'll want to look up because you will not see it again anytime soon. This is The National. Like many provinces, Ontario has done a kind of dance with COVID-19, tailoring measures to its different regions. Not anymore. Starting the day after Christmas, new measures kick in everywhere. Ontario will enter a province-wide shutdown starting at 12.01 a.m. on December 26. The province's modelling shows why. Even if the curve was flat, Ontario's ICUs face unprecedented stress. 300 COVID patients in intensive care within days. But the curve is not flat. And if case rates were to take off by 3% a day or more, a scenario seen in other places with soft restrictions, well, within a month, COVID patients could occupy up to 1,500 ICU beds. So worried about a potential onslaught in cases after holiday gatherings, the province decided doing nothing was not an option. Magda Gebrselasa begins our coverage tonight. What out of control caseloads and deaths look like. Looking at another provincial lockdown, Doug Ford delivered the Boxing Day deadline and business owner and teacher Priya Mohan was watching. I think they're calling it the COVID pivot. We're doing another COVID pivot. So that happens both at the store and at school. For most of the province, the lockdown will last at least until January 23rd. Restrictions include no indoor gatherings with anyone outside your household. Non-essential retail is limited to curbside and delivery, and back to school is impacted too. In-person school won't start until at least January 11th. This difficult action is without a doubt necessary to save lives and prevent our hospitals from being overwhelmed. Without new measures, modeling shows new cases and hospitalizations could skyrocket. Even schedule their surgery. Which is why this doctor says don't wait to act. All I can ask my community and everyone in Ontario is that even if the lockdown doesn't start till Boxing Day, it is our responsibility to follow the instructions and stay at home as if the lockdown started today. But in areas where cases are low, some pushback. In Ottawa, there are 19 COVID patients in hospital, zero in the ICU. This doctor says the new restrictions don't add up. I see more patients with mental health issues, with substance abuse, with overdoses currently than I do of COVID-19. Still, this infectious disease physician defends a widespread lockdown. I think we have to assume that there is going to be transmission from high incidence to low incidence settings, and that's going to set off local problems. Even though this will hit businesses across the province hard. This is awful and this is bad, um, but losing people is awful and bad too. For as long as it takes, Mohan will keep business going with curbside pickups and her classes will go virtual next month. Well, Magda, we know this lockdown is province-wide for now, but some parts of the province are going to drop restrictions sooner than others. That's right. So Northern Ontario will actually be in this lockdown for half that time. And that's because that's really a, a, an area of the province that hasn't been a hot zone for COVID-19 cases recently. In fact, the CEO of Health Sciences North said that hospital doesn't have any COVID-19 cases, but he does warn that if people don't follow the rules over the holidays, well, of course, things could change and head in the wrong direction. And that's where we find ourselves in many parts of southern Ontario, where the lockdown will last for at least four weeks now. Thanks for this, Magda. 
Well, Monks, I mentioned in-person classes in Ontario are going to be delayed by these new rules in the new year. That is a blow to some families, but as Deanna Sumanak-Johnson tells us, the province says right now it's worth it. Anna K. Brown knew the announcement was coming. Her kids' elementary schools, including six-year-old Ariana's, will not reopen as planned after the holidays. It was necessary. Um, I just think that I wish if he would have done just made the announcement a month earlier. I think it would just give parents more um, more room to who are working and, and will not have that two weeks off in January to make more preparation. Ontario follows several other provinces, including Quebec and Alberta, in deciding to delay the start of in-person classes. In northern Ontario, all students will be learning remotely until January 11th, while in southern Ontario, elementary schools will be online till January 11th and high school students till January 25th. That can play a critical role in reducing transmission. More importantly, it can play a critical role in flattening this curve. This teachers' union rep says the delayed start is a relief to some teachers, but seems to contradict government's own message. On the one hand, he's saying schools aren't uh, a source of viral spread, and on the other hand, he's saying we're going to shut down secondary schools uh, for three weeks. We just believe, look, we're not the source of this problem, but we will be part of the solution. If we see a post-holiday surge, reducing contacts is a must, says this infectious disease specialist. So I think if, if people are going to have their, those dinners and, and meetings before the, the, the lockdown, um, then I think it's better to keep those kids that may be exposed to other people home. Anna K. Brown will work from home while her kids are out of school, but she cautions it's a luxury not all parents have as they brace for a lockdown that they hope only lasts a few weeks. Deanna Sumanak-Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. Well, when it comes to provinces that tried and failed to bring case rates down with targeted lockdowns, Ontario is not alone. Quebec reported 2,108 new cases today and 30 deaths. That is three straight days now of case numbers above the 2,000 mark. Manitoba, in contrast, reported just 167 cases today. That's the lowest number seen in almost seven weeks there and part of an established downward trend after a strict province-wide shutdown went into effect last month. Alberta's case count, 1,240 new cases today, still worse than any other province per capita, but case numbers there are trending downward as well and have been for a full week now. Restrictions may be working, but a group of Albertans and churches wanted an immediate injunction to end them, saying their rules are limiting their freedoms. Well, that injunction was denied today in a Calgary court. Let's turn to that new variant of coronavirus found in the United Kingdom. So far, there's no evidence that it is in Canada, but it is certainly causing concern here and around the world. Vicodopia has the latest on what we know, what we don't, and what it means going forward. Spreading from person to person, the coronavirus has already mutated several times. This latest variant is said to be more contagious, but... There's zero evidence at this point that there's any increase in, in severity associated with this uh, disease. Clearly, work is ongoing to look at uh, transmission um, and, and the increased rates of transmission and how much of that is attributable to this uh, particular variant. Scientists say the mutations are in the virus's spikes, making it better at infecting people, resulting in a higher reproduction or infection rate. In Canada, the current rate averages 1.1, meaning 10 infected people today can turn into 18 infections in a week. This new variant's rate is estimated at 1.5, so in a week, 10 people can become 114. In a month, it's thousands. It's only a model. The more pressing matter, whether the new vaccines will still be effective. Whether or not we can look at antibodies from patients that have been vaccinated and identify whether those antibodies still neutralize this new variant of the virus. The two frontrunner vaccines are engineered to attack the coronavirus's spikes based on their genetic information and can be reprogrammed. An mRNA vaccine as the Pfizer and Moderna ones actually have that capability of where the, the mRNA can actually be synthesized differently if needed. So there is some room for movement and improvement should that happen. 
It all depends on whether Canadian labs can quickly detect these mutations. You know, we may be lucky this time, this particular virus may not be more virulent, but we need to do surveillance for enhanced virulence. For now, the new variant doesn't change the latest public health advice. If anything, it calls for more vigilance. Vic Adopia, CBC News, Toronto. The United Kingdom has locked down its capital to try to contain the variant's spread, and other countries are shutting UK travelers out. As far Morali shows us, that is prompting new concerns about food supply. It's the road that leads to the Strait of Dover, the gateway to France. But today, the M20 looked more like a parking lot for trucks. Last night, France closed its border with the UK over concerns about the new coronavirus variant. The closure brought trucks to a standstill and stranded drivers. I take freight to Britain and I can't go back home. Others like, were luckier. I'll be able to get home for Christmas, but a lot of these people that are sitting on the M20 are not going to get home for Christmas. Many of those trucks heading to France would normally bring fresh food back. Now, there are worries about potential shortages over the holidays. Today, supermarkets tried to calm those fears. So too did Britain's Prime Minister, saying the vast majority of food and supplies are coming in as normal. We're working to a solution, as I say, uh, as fast as we can to allow freight traffic to resume between the UK and France and to ensure that lorries can travel in both directions in a COVID secure way. European Union members met to discuss a joint approach to the new COVID variant and the attempts to secure its borders. More than 40 countries have now closed their borders to the UK, leaving some passengers stranded at London's Heathrow Airport and putting a halt to some Eurostar trains. Back at the port of Dover, drivers are bracing for a long night. France's ban is set to last 48 hours. The hope among many, they'll be able to make it home before Christmas. Farah Morali, CBC News, London. People in the UK hoping to fly into Canada are out of luck, at least for the next couple of days. Ashley Burke takes us through how this country is responding to that potential threat from across the Atlantic. To our international friends and, and partners, uh, I want to say uh, very frankly that we understand uh, your concerns. With the UK taking steps to lock down a mutating virus, Canada is taking steps to lock it out. For the next 72 hours, um, there will be no, there will be no uh, passengers arriving in Canada from the United Kingdom. This pause gives us that time to put in appropriate protective measures. But it's possible that travellers with the new strain may already be here. Public health officials across the country analyzing cases to see if the virus variant has arrived. We are taking this seriously. That's why we are asking any travelers who arrived from the United Kingdom within the past 14 days to immediately get tested for COVID-19. Canada is also watching to make sure nobody traveling from the UK tries to slip in through another country. More Canada Border Service agents at airports and travelers will be asked if they've been to Europe in the past 14 days. Anyone caught lying coming from the UK could face up to six months in prison or up to $750,000 in fines. Our borders are like a sieve, like a spaghetti drainer. Ontario's Premier took aim at the federal government, accusing it of not doing enough. At minimum, we need to test air travellers when they arrive at the airport. International travel is not the uh, is not the cause of the spread of COVID-19 in Ontario. 1.3 percent of uh, the cases in Ontario are attributed to this. Canada's already closed its land border to the U.S. Now it's banning flights from the U.K., closing the door on two of Canada's most important allies in the name of public health. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, Health Canada has received the final documents needed to complete its review of Moderna's COVID-19 vaccine. The Canadian press is reporting the federal regulator could authorize Canada's second coronavirus vaccine soon. After the U.S. approved it on Friday, Health Canada said it expected its review of Moderna's vaccine to be completed in the coming weeks. Americans began to receive the first doses of the Moderna shot today. No, no, you just go ahead anytime you're ready. That's U.S. President-elect Joe Biden receiving his dose of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine live on television today. Biden says he wanted to give a boost of confidence to Americans watching at home. 
and convince them the vaccine is safe. Well, Biden will be sworn in as president in a month, but Donald Trump and his supporters are still throwing around conspiracy theories about widespread voter fraud. As Katie Simpson tells us, a once reliable ally is distancing himself from all of that. The attorney general is using his final days in office to make it clear he will not help the president overturn the election results, morning, rejecting uh, the need you, to investigate uh, conspiracy who, uh, theories about widespread voter fraud. If I thought a special counsel at this stage was the right tool uh, and was appropriate, I, <clears throat> I, would do, I would name one, but I haven't and I'm not going to. Bill Barr then shot down another of Donald Trump's hopes, saying there's no need for a special investigation into Hunter Biden, the son of President-elect Joe Biden. I have not seen a reason to appoint a special counsel, and I have no plan to do so before I leave. Trump also lost another valuable ally in the fight to save his political life. Newsmax would like to clarify its news coverage. And the right-wing media outlet Newsmax walked back false claims, claims it aired about, about electronic voting machines manipulating results. All of this comes as Trump considers new measures to hold on to power, including consulting with his disgraced former national security advisor, Michael Flynn, who floated the idea of martial law. He could take military capabilities and he could place them in those states and basically rerun an election in each of those states. A suggestion alarming members of Trump's base. The idea of sending the military to end a rerun it would, would be a massive, massive red line. And, and I'm certain the president won't do it, but I think it's certainly worth talking about because people around him are advocating for it. There's less than a month left in Trump's term. His behavior suggests he'll use that time to keep fighting the election results with or without his allies. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. Canada is resettling nearly 100 refugees who have spent years in detention centres near Australia. Briar Stewart starts her story with someone now safely in Canada who knew those centres well. It was just over five years ago that Ali Karsa and his father were among the first refugees to leave an Australian immigration detention centre. They ended up there after fleeing Syria. They tried to seek asylum in Australia, but the government wouldn't take them. Instead, they and hundreds of others were diverted to a detention centre on Nauru, an impoverished island in the South Pacific. It didn't really look like a detention centre. It looked more like a jail. It was uh, covered with fences around and security guards. That detention centre, along with another on Papua New Guinea, is now closed but many asylum seekers are still stuck on those islands. The U.S. agreed to take in around a thousand of them, but some have been left behind. I am stuck here. I apply U.S. and then two time rejected. And then I'm still waiting. Now I, I Mu Win, who is Rohingya, is one of nearly 100 refugees who will eventually be coming to Canada. With the help of private donors, a BC-based settlement agency is sponsoring them. So waiting seven years and hearing that they would come to Canada, um, they, they are anxiously waiting to hear back. They're still in limbo because of COVID-19. There's one more step before the paperwork is complete, and officials say that can't be done until the visa office reopens in Sydney. But the fact that they're slated to come here is welcome news for CARSA. It's amazing to hear that. Carsa, who became a Canadian citizen last year, still keeps in touch with a few people on Nauru. I have a young friend that is my age. You know, I feel like he's just getting uh, more depressed and more, you know, weaker every time I talk to him, and it's really sad. Which is why he feels sad that so many are still there, years after he got the chance to leave. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. Police in Newfoundland have arrested prison staff in connection with the death of an Indigenous inmate back in 2019. Jonathan Henook died while awaiting trial on murder charges at Her Majesty's Penitentiary in St. John's. The coroner later ruled it a homicide. After a year-long investigation, today officials confirmed the arrests but would not specify how many or on what charges. A woman in Winnipeg says she's terrified to get back in a vehicle after a shocking case of road rage. Hey! You guys 
trying to kill us. Terrifying moments for the woman and her dad who caught part of the relentless pursuit from the passenger seat. That feeling and that fear will stick with me probably for the rest of my life. Remarkably, no one was seriously hurt. Police say the driver of that truck is going to be charged with dangerous operation of a vehicle. The Forum in Montreal, Maple Leaf Gardens in Toronto. Winnipeg's Hudson Bay building is also a city landmark. But while those hockey rinks found a new life after their famous tenants departed, Cameron McIntosh shows it's not clear how the bay can. At a crossroad, both literally and figuratively. Historically priceless, economically worthless, and just massive. The bay is historic and now shuttered former national flagship store, Winnipeg's 650,000 square foot problem. As a kid, I remember every Christmas coming down here with my mom. Dana Spiring remembers Christmas displays in those windows. She's leading a committee trying to figure out what can be done with this. We've got to do something that, that makes financial sense, but we've got to do something that's great for this community. This is Portage Avenue. Back in the 1920s, it was a hub of retail and commerce for Western Canada. Down the street, Toronto-based Edens was expanding its empire west. The Hudson's Bay Company looking to compete and reinvent itself. Bet big on this corner. Breaking ground in 1926 on its flagship store, a full city block, then Canada's largest reinforced concrete building opening to clamoring crowds, offering high-end fashion, dining, and entertainment. It wasn't just about um, retail, it was also about kind of an expression of who we are as a company, who we are in Canada's history. I wish I had a time machine, honestly. Architect and historian Brent Bellamy has seen plenty of redevelopment proposals, all scuttled by the building's age, size, and lack of interior light. They've all sort of considered the idea of taking a hole through the middle. Everybody who's looked at redeveloping the building in the past has realized that it's a hundred million dollar plus um, endeavor. An analysis deemed a repurposed building would never be worth that. While some developers say it should be torn down, Spiring believes Christmas will be marked here again. For the right buyer and the right group of people, this is going to be something iconic. My best guess right now is that this exists in some form, not its current form. A 20th century monument in need of a monumental 21st century vision. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. A rare celestial event is taking over the sky tonight. It's like a big machine that's just running forward. Up next, when Jupiter meets Saturn, seeing a rare double at the end of an unprecedented year. Plus, coping with COVID isolation during the holidays. Our panel is here to answer your questions about mental health. And later, frozen in time. This is a complete mummified wolf pup. We can see her ears with little tufts of hair. A fascinating Canadian discovery from the Ice Age. We're back into. No crowds at Stonehenge to mark this year's winter solstice, but the longest night of the year is still a much needed reminder that brighter days are ahead. The winter solstice is one thing, but it comes every year. Tonight, there was an added bonus in the sky, one that comes far less often. It's called the Great Conjunction, when Jupiter and Saturn appear to touch. Rafi Bajikanian looks at this very rare happening. It's rare not to need this kind of rig to see Jupiter and Saturn. It's like a big machine that's just running forward and on the 21st is when all those pieces are aligned just right for these two planets to get really, really close. The solar system's two biggest planets only get that close every four centuries. The last time they did it at night was 800 years ago, long before telescopes. CBC's archives don't go that far back, but it could be seen tonight in parts of the world with few clouds in the sky. I've had a few neighbours ask me about it. And um, yeah, we all wish we could have seen them. But... Not a whole lot of luck for local stargazers, even those with something a bit more hefty than a pair of binoculars. We now understand what they are. And 400 years ago, most of our ancestors would have, you know, still thought the Earth was flat. 
In fact, go back further still and some think the Great Conjunction may well be an explanation for a biblical phenomenon. Literally, at the start of Bethlehem, what could it have been? Well, it could have been a conjunction of planets. And if these wise men were astrologers, the forerunner of astronomers, they knew of this grand conjunction and maybe that had special significance to them to bring them to Bethlehem. That's the general idea. And hey, if you missed out on all this because you were somewhere cloudy, you can still look way up tomorrow. The two planets will still be almost as close as they were today. Rafi Bujikani on CBC News, Edmonton. Glad we've got another chance to see it. We're going to keep looking up and later in the show how some of you are finding light right now. But first. For students like myself who are currently studying away from home, how would you suggest coping with feelings of isolation that might be negatively affecting students' mental health? It's an important question and the answer is coming up next. Two doctors offer their advice for navigating this pandemic holiday. We'll be right back. Welcome back. This final stretch of the year during any other year is usually about disconnecting from work and reconnecting with friends and family. If there were ever a time we all needed both of those things, it sure would be now. Pandemic restrictions, though, are forcing us to be restrained and a bit creative. For millions of people, the weight of what is unfolding is very serious. It is taking a deep toll. So we want to give everyone some tools to help get through and to help people in your lives who may need it as well. And we have some help tonight on The National to do that. Dr. David Greitzer is a psychiatrist at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, or CAMH, in Toronto. Dr. Shimmy Kang is a psychiatrist and author in Vancouver. Thank you both for making time for us. Well, Dr. Greitzer, let me start with you. It is certainly important to stay informed and follow all of the guidelines. It's a lot to take in, though. So what's your advice to people to make sure they find out what's going on but still stay healthy mentally? Sure. It, it seems poor form to go on a news show and suggest we watch less news. But alas, I think that's what I'm going to do tonight. Um, we're all off our games. Our regular schedules have been thrown off. We're not commuting to work like we used to because maybe we're working from home, maybe we're not even working. However, in the literature, it talks to things about the importance of maintaining routine and schedule. So even if you're not going downtown for work, say, getting dressed and getting up in the morning is important. We're very tempted to watch the news multiple times over the day on our devices, on our TVs, and so on. Maybe we should spend more time scheduling social contacts with our friends, exercise, and define times when we watch the news, but not all the time because, frankly, it can be a little bit overwhelming. Check in in the morning and the evening to CBC News. That's, that's my suggestion. Shannon Barner is from Edmonton. She's got little ones at home, and she's trying to guide them through this difficult time. Have a listen. My question is for my three elementary aged children who are asking about when do we get to see our cousins and grandparents over the holiday season, to which we can't because of COVID. I am wondering, is there a professional response or something more that we could be providing for the kids? Should we be providing more than just a simple no because of COVID answer? Such a great question. Dr. Kang, what should we be saying to children? Right. Well, I would tell Shannon to combine truth and optimism. So children actually know what's going on. Uh, we don't want to sugarcoat things, but we want to give them age appropriate truth. And the more information, the better. The brain likes information. It doesn't, it gets scared of the unknown. So, you know, explain why we're socially distanced, explain how the virus is contagious, explain um, why some of the recommendations are in place and then end in optimism. So definitely talk about, we're still going to have a great holiday season. We're going to drop off gifts or do a uh, choir on zoom with grandparents uh, and end with that tone of optimism. The brain loves that. Uh, so when we combine truth and op optimism, great way to communicate with children and adults. And Dr. Greatser, the next one is for you and it comes for, for and from older students, the ones in college and university. Chloe Champion is in Halifax. For students like myself who are currently studying away from home, how would you suggest coping with feelings of isolation that might be negatively affecting students' mental health? Well, Chloe, that's a, a great question for university and college students. Frankly, it's a great question for all of us because we might not be away at school. We might be a 10-minute walk from our parents and yet really distant from them because of the circumstances. So first things first, let's remember how we shouldn't 
cope with isolation. Uh, in recent surveys done by CAMH and Delvinia, we find that one in four Canadians is turning to binge drinking within the last week. Ouch. It's important for us to use substance in moderation. And it's also important for us to find other ways of coping with this isolation uh, that we're all feeling that, and the loneliness as well. So reaching out to friends and family, obviously it's going to be different than it usually is. We're not popping by our parents' place for a cup of coffee, but maybe we can reach out with Skype or FaceTime or WeChat. If you're a more traditional kind of guy like me, perhaps it's a phone call. Maybe it's even writing a letter, but it's important for us to maintain our connection with people, and it's important for us to maintain a, a healthy lifestyle and, frankly, pretty stressful times. A connection, even at one time in the day, is so helpful, and some fresh air I've found as well. Even pre-pandemic, mm -hmm. though, many of us find the holidays difficult to get through because there's so much pressure to be festive. You're supposed to be surrounded by friends and family, so if any of those pieces are missing, it's a really tough time. So the holidays plus pandemic and then the restrictions certainly exacerbating things to say the least. And this next question speaks to that. How do you know when feeling lonely and unhappy has veered into depression? Dr. Kang, what should people be looking for in themselves, but also others? Right. So first we have to understand the power of loneliness. Loneliness is actually toxic. It reduces our immune system and actually is linked to early death. So we really have to work on that social connection. And we can be lonely in a room full of people and we can feel emotionally connected staying home. So uh, to improve that, you want to um, go deeper in our relationships, more vulnerability, more laughs, more jokes. And then if there are um, symptoms of depression that last more than two weeks, which is a low mood, plus disturbed sleep, a difficulty with your focus, concentration, lack of interest, motivation, anxiety, panic, or any suicidal thoughts, you definitely want to get some help, uh, talk to family and friends, and then further professional help as well. And Dr. Great, so just before we go, top three tips you would give to folks uh, what they should be doing in a day to help them get through? There's a lovely little paper in the British Journal of Psychiatry that recently appeared that talks about staying mentally healthy during times of self-isolation. Here are three tips that you can incorporate into your life. One, learn. Uh, we're designed to learn. It's intellectually stimulating. So you don't have to learn Japanese tonight, but some type of learning to incorporate into your day can be useful. Two, give. Obviously, charitable acts are very different right now, but even helping an elderly neighbor doing some shopping is very rewarding for them, but it's also very rewarding for you. And thirdly, exercise. There are very few things that are as evidence as exercise for not only treating major mental illness like depression and anxiety, but preventing it in the first place. Dr. Great, sir, Dr. Kang, thank you again for your time. Thank you. Helpful sure. advice. Now, if you or someone you know does need support, you can call or text Crisis Services Canada. The number is one 833 456 4566 kids help phone 1-800-668-6868 people are available around the clock to help you there you are definitely not alone well after the break a dna discovery that ended up saving a woman's life there was always the little bit of like when is the taking time bomb gonna go off and when might i get the cancer it was too much how a family history of stomach cancer pushed her to make a life-altering decision her story is next. Welcome back. These are uncertain times for so many people, worrying about your own health and the health of those you love. It is something one Saskatchewan family knows all too well. A rare and deadly stomach cancer runs in their family. That means extreme measures are necessary. Bonnie Allen has their story. It takes a certain fortitude to be a farmer, always at the mercy of Mother Nature. A little bit more of it. For Summer Hyde, facing the uncertainty of what each year will hold for her and her husband on the farm pales in comparison to fears she has already conquered. A deadly stomach cancer runs in her family, and the 32-year-old has had to make agonizing decisions and take drastic steps to save her own life. 
there was always the little bit of like, when is the ticking time bomb gonna go off? And when might I get the cancer? It was too much fear over the unknown, so. Hyde was only two years old when her aunt Rosemary passed away from stomach cancer. She was just 29 years old. I was very concerned for my children because I knew nothing about cancer. Rosemary's husband, Luke Lawrence, remembers asking the doctor whether their children were at risk. He says cancer is not contagious. They didn't know anything about hereditary forms of cancer, but at the time that was the right answer. But then, 16 years later, their daughter Erin was diagnosed with the same cancer. She was 20 years old and dead within seven months. Before Erin passed away, she got genetic testing. It revealed a rare mutation in the CDH1 gene that can pass down through families. It causes hereditary diffuse gastric cancer. We didn't know none of this until it was far too late because Erin had already been diagnosed with stage four of this form of cancer. So it was to create an awareness for the family more so than what we could do for Erin. And uh, that's why we did it. Uh -huh. So Summer Hyde and some other family members got tested too. Five people had the mutation, including her grandmother, her father and her. It was like devastating, obviously, but it wasn't, I think I was so young and naive that I really didn't think about what that actually meant. What that meant was she had an 83% chance of getting the deadly cancer in her lifetime. The only way to prevent it is to remove her entire stomach. It's called a prophylactic total gastrectomy. Hyde considered it, but her doctor told her it could mean no children. She decided to wait. I wanted to have my kids naturally. I didn't like you can do IVF and have the embryos tested for the gene and then not implant the ones that have the gene, but I didn't want to do that. I do feel like some feel like it's a little bit selfish because I could spare my kids from having the gene, but I wouldn't get the kids that I have if I were to choose that and I would never choose anybody different. Hyde and her husband had two daughters and her anxiety grew. She was terrified of leaving them without a mother. It was always in the back of my mind that it was only seven months that Erin was diagnosed and passed away. And so every like Christmas or birthday or any type of holiday, I would always go above and beyond because take lots of pictures, make it perfect in case it was their last one with me. You can see anything? Then in 2014, her younger sister, Ali Kowalik, also tested positive for the gene mutation. I was gonna have the surgery. I knew. She had her entire stomach removed, and afterward, tests on what was taken out showed cancer. He said that it came back with stage one cancer, so it was hard to hear. Still hard to talk about, actually. I don't talk about that part very much. Undetected, it would have gone on to kill her. The surgery got rid of it. I could not be here today. I could not have him. It was a wake-up call for her big sister. It was way too much anxiety for me to carry to not do the surgery. In 2015, Hyde finally got her stomach removed. The recovery was difficult, but now, except for dietary restrictions, life is pretty normal. I feel amazing and it was worth all the pain and fighting in the beginning and it was definitely worth it. Her worries aren't over though. The worry about myself has now been put onto my kids because I just worry and hope that none of them have the gene. Each of their children has a 50% chance of inheriting the gene mutation. They can get tested when they're 18. The two women hope that by then medical advancements will provide better options for testing, treating and preventing the disease. I have high hopes for him. <laughs> It's hard, but it is what it is, and we're lucky that we get the chance at life. Summer Hyde is trying to set an example for them, being ready to face whatever comes her way. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, near Rokenville, Saskatchewan. Well, still ahead for you, an incredible Canadian discovery dating back to the Ice Age. We almost never find mummified animals like this with skin and flesh. 
Not too bad for a 57,000 year old wolf pup. We'll look at its significance for scientists and the First Nation it was found on. I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's Daily News podcast, Front Burner, a new coronavirus strain in the UK has us asking if the mutation affects treatment and transmission of the virus and vaccine efficacy. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Well, welcome back. An unusual fossil found in Yukon is proving a treasure trove for scientists. They have been studying it for a while, and now they're talking about it. The it that we're talking about is a 57,000 year old wolf cub, almost completely intact. Cheryl Kawaja picks up the story. Well, this is a complete mummified wolf pup. We can see her ears with little tufts of hair. Yukon paleontologist Grant Zazula calls this little gray wolf remarkable. We almost never find mummified animals like this with skin and flesh. It was found a few years ago while gold miners were blasting a wall of permafrost. And realizing the little pup could be important, Neil Loveless put it in a gold pan and put it in the freezer. When Zazula picked it up, he knew it was more valuable than gold. But before his team could begin their work, the ancient animal was honored by the Trundakwichin First Nation, on whose traditional territory it was found. Elders gathered together quite quickly and um, they wanted to show respect with them. Um, with his baby um, baby wolf, uh, which we call um, uh, Little Jur now, uh, which in Han language, it means uh, Little Wolf. The scientists started calling her Jur as well. So the first thing we did was radiocarbon data to find out how old she is. And then we reached out to geneticists for, to look at the ancient DNA. So we were able to extract and sequence a complete genome to understand its genetic history. Scientists determined she was just seven weeks old when she died 57,000 years ago. And genetic testing reveals she isn't related to contemporary North American wolves, but rather Ice Age wolves from Russia. When we did her x-rays, we found out we, she still even has all her organs intact, which is incredible. So she's basically like 100% intact. Researchers even determined her last meal, another surprise, salmon, not bison or caribou as they had expected. The findings are so significant, they were put on the cover of this month's scientific journal, Current Biology. But as rare as this ancient wolf pup is, scientists say with global warming and more permafrost melting, they're expecting more Ice Age treasures like her to emerge from the mud. Cheryl Kawaja, CBC News, Whitehorse. Well, next on the National For You, words from a young poet on the darkest day of the year. On the shortest day of the year, we don't have to turn the clock backwards. Her thoughts on today's winter solstice. That's next in our moment. On this darkest and shortest day of the year, the official start of winter, it is also a good reminder that each day forward is going to bring a little more light. Pajita Varma is Mississauga, Ontario's Youth Poet Laureate. She wrote about the winter solstice and the light it will usher in. Tonight, her poem is our moment. On the shortest day of the year, we don't have to turn the clock backwards. Watch as the night sky unweaves, if just from the windowsill. Or how darkness only exists through absence. Like this, we learn all puzzles are built backwards, from syrup to source. Walk home in the floating embrace of thin ice, comfort in knowing we are completely surrounded. In this moment, we hold everything between splinters of silence, the balancing act of the seasons as crimson leaf turns sunset to shadow, following endless orange streaks trailing home, the way home unrolled from beyond the window, silhouettes traced across border. Still, on the longest nights, my mother lights candles, places them in the porcelain palms of the coffee table, our lighthouse in the city flickers 
floats across to the neighbors, a message. The days will get longer from here. There are times we all need to leave. Look up. The constellations uncover in circles as we fill our mugs, taking turns sipping the light. Oh, Pochita, what a gift for all of us. Thank you so much, and thank you for joining us. That is the National for this Monday, December 21st. Good night. <laughs>